들어 치는 걸로 치는 말아 치는 거. 헬로 웰컴 투 에뉴 에피소드 오브 톡 터키. Hi from Brussels Nation. We are again here with one more surprising development from Turkey. We are, I guess, used to such surprises, but many in Brussels are not. So we will discuss this mm. and try to explain Turkey's potential BRICS membership. I guess, I mean, Brussels is trying to sort out if Turkey really has a foreign policy or what Turkey is trying to do, because that's what we do in Turkey. That's the main question. Yeah. That's the main question. Yeah. Now the new topic is BRICS. Would Turkey become a member of BRICS? I mean, it doesn't seem likely because lately Lavrov said BRICS is not really considering enlarging um, the, yet. So th that was a that was a full stop for now. But just to just to, to you know uh, come up with a brief reminder, actually this BRICS issue have been talked about in Turkey uh, by the government since since 2018 more or less. From time to time, they come up with either like some foreign minister says something about that, or Mr. Erdogan says something about. That. And not only BRICS, um, also Turkey at some point wanted to join uh, this Shanghai Cooperation Organization. Then, I don't know, nobody's talking about that anymore. But the latest hot topic was uh, BRICS. Uh, Mr. Erdogan has been mentioning BRICS, but we have read, it's been a month, in September, Bloomberg, Bloomberg International covered the story, an article about that. And Bloomberg said Turkey applied officially to become a member of the BRICS organization. There was no official comment from Turkey. And actually, journalists asked uh, officials. There wasn't, we couldn't get anything clear, you know, uh, not from the foreign ministry uh, sources. They were, they were not denying it, but they were not confirming it either. So Hakan Fidan gave an interview to some TV channel and he sort of, he sort of confirmed, you know, he did not say publicly, yes, we applied uh, under such and such circumstances. He said, yeah, yes, BRICS, why not? And also, we are also considering ASEAN. He said something like that. So that's how we heard about that. So Bloomberg brought it up first. So we're thinking it was the Russian side. The Russians wanted to be heard. Turkey did not uh, openly want to um, uh, basically announce uh, the application. I guess one reason was, I think Turkey was considering there could be objections uh, within the organization of BRICS. So I think they wanted to like, um, um, this, they wanted this procedure to be from the back channels. You know, they didn't, they didn't want to make it public or anything. We know that India has been against Turkey's membership because basically Turkey is applying a subtle arms embargo in India because India is in, you know, cohorts with, with Pakistan. Uh, so Turkey is traditionally a Pakistani ally due to uh, religious and historical uh, ties. So India was against it. So that's probably why Turkey didn't want to make it public, but it was public at the end of the day. Russians, and after Bloomberg covered it, then Russians, I believe it was Mr. Harov or again, Mr. Lavrov, they uh, mentioned Turkey applied officially. And uh, just only repeating again, only Hakan Fidan <laughs> confirmed it subtly, not openly. That's how we heard it. But a month later, in October, uh, Mr. Lavrov, Lavrov said, yeah, we're not, we're not basically considering to enlarge BRICS anymore. And he mentioned Ukraine. Uh, he said, especially uh, in Ukrainian issue, we want unity, basically. Um, um, we want everybody on, on our side, on, on, the, on the same side. So at this point, we're not uh, considering enlarging the BRICS. And there is not, there is not yet any official uh, statement from the Turkish side. I mean, this says a lot about the transparency and predictability, I guess. And this is one of the biggest issues with the current government's approach. Uh, maybe it's not going to happen, but that was already a bad signal, I think, for Turkey's traditional allies, traditional partners in the West. And at the same time, it doesn't really build a trust-based relationship with countries like Russia or China either, because they definitely don't and won't see Turkey as a real ally. They know that as a NATO member, Turkey cannot fully align with them. Um, plus, there is no real potential for strong partnership, considering uh, that there are not enough common interests in uh, many areas. We discussed this before when we discussed uh, Turkish-Russian relations as well. And 
Also, unlike Turkey's traditional partnerships, I think it's very hard to build equal relationship with countries like Russia and China. I mean, some might not like to admit it, but Turkey has a lot of influence in the West, despite all problems, and especially with the NATO. I mean, we saw this again uh, in the accession of uh, Finland and Sweden to NATO, for example. And Russia and China would never give Turkey that kind of power or influence in their own organizations, in their own influence sphere. And most importantly, I think Turkey matters to Russia and China, also mainly because the fact that it's a NATO ally, and despite all the issues, it is still a part of the Western alliance. So this is a key strategic point that increases Turkey's leverage with them. We have to understand that Turkey, as a NATO member with Customs Union, with the EU, has different leverage when dealing with Russia and China. And top of that, I think uh, both countries see better relations with Turkey as a way to weaken uh, NATO and the West and create some sort of uh, trouble for the unity of the West as well. So we see mixed signals and lack of predictability. And the real benefit isn't clear either. Sure, there will be some economic value in case of such a membership, but it can also hurt. And I think it is already doing it, even the rumors about it. Turkey's economic ties with the West as well, because uh, in the end, Turkey might also find itself in a worse position. This is what some people People don't get in international relations. Sometimes 10 plus 2 doesn't really make 12. I mean, Turkey may gain 2, but may also lose in trade, investments, tourism, and image. And in that case, maybe 10 plus 2 will be 8 or 9. So uh, that's also why we need to be a bit more careful. And also all these confusing signals, I think even worse than the BRICS membership itself. This is not the only example either. For example, recently, uh, Turkey signed uh, this investment deal with the Chinese uh, leading electric vehicle company, um, BYD. Uh, so on the one hand, Turkey wants to modernize the customs union with the EU. On the other hand, Turkey signs such a deal which may give China an alternative access to European markets by, by passing the restrictions. One more example. On the one hand, Turkey wants to join BRICS, but then uh, I don't know if you saw, but Turkey just joined the Mineral Security Partnership, MSP Forum, last week. Um, this is an important step. A lot of people missed it. Uh, it's an organization initiated by the US and the EU to accelerate the development of uh, alternative uh, supply chains for the critical raw material. And the objective is mainly to reduce dependency on countries like China and Russia. So, Yes, this is an important development for Turkey, Turkey's strategy, investments in critical raw materials, but again, sending confusing signals like, do you want to work with China? Do you want to work against China? Like, where do you stand? Like, it makes Turkey less reliable for both sides and less predictable. And I don't think it's in the interest of Turkey also in uh, mid and long term. Uh, we don't hear you, Nish. So I was saying, I mean, in terms of in terms of mathematics, in terms of trade also, basically, Turkey's main trade partner is the EU still when you check the numbers and what we do is we sell more to the eu i mean be it vegetables be it, uh some raw materials whatever you know but like when you when you look at the trade balance between with russia and china actually with the chinese you know it's very very imbalanced we buy a lot from china and we basically sell nothing to china so the, you know the imbalance is really striking so it doesn't really make sense to, to for turkey to basically leave the west and try to join in the in the in, in the other gang with the with the russia and china it doesn't it doesn't make mathematical sense well, why is turkey trying to do that well i mean listen i know most of the time we are looking for grand strategies in erdogan's government also the new uh, considerably new foreign minister hakan fidan and the hakan fidan i mean the west i don't know why thought he was the rational person wise man who knows the region you know who make the more rational decisions i I'd say how confident is a great disappointment, but because because we actually lost, uh, we we forgot the reality that now I mean I probably 
some of our Turkish viewers will will remember that Hakan Fidan, like when he was the when I, when he was the head of the MIT, uh, Mr. Davutoğlu back then he was a prime minister and he's one of the most adventurous adventurous and ideologists you know in a, in a sense it's a very ideological he was a very ideological prime minister, he's the architect of uh, the failing the failed even um, Middle Eastern foreign po policy of of Turkey. So, 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 so anyways, I mean he was tried he Mr. Davutoğlu tried to bring Hakan done as an MP back in the time to the parliament he's very like-minded to Mr. Davutoğlu uh, meaning like he's also in the same line in the same line with Muslim Brotherhood so there is that he's a very ideological person I am really doubting he's he's seeing the world rationally I think ideology is toppling uh, rationality in his case so I mean um, keeping that in mind uh, there is that and also i mean usually there are no grand strategies or anything <clears throat> usually it's just daily you know pragmatist some decisions and they change their mind like in a week 170 180 degrees you never know so i mean i was thinking actually winter is approaching and turkey is under austerity measures of mehmet Şimşek, which they're calling it disinflationist measures okay inflation is going to go down uh, basically we're going to see better numbers but how basically the purchasing numbers is like literally on the floor people cannot buy anything uh it's 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 really intense so the last thing they need is buying uh, natural gas from russia uh, from a more expensive price you know they need uh, putin to cut them some slack i think basically they're after that honestly i think this is just a very short term <laughs> you know they can tell mr putin you know what our heart is with you we like bricks more cut us some slack i don't know maybe we can we can just pay you later or something or give us a special price about this natural gas why don't you do something like that i mean i perceive this bricks thing you know as something as simple as that to be honest i mean you you mentioned the trades imbalance um or more balance with uh, with the west with the eu i've also checked numbers just before um we record this so maybe i can also provide a few examples so that's also clearer maybe for our viewers uh in terms of bilateral trade between Turkey and the EU actually uh, there was a new record uh, in 2023 it's 206 billion and Turkey has become uh, EU's fifth largest trade partner and the EU is Turkey's largest trade partner it hasn't changed and as you said also it's quite balanced trade relationship it's not only about the volume of the trade but also uh, in terms of imports and exports so Turkey's import uh, from the EU is around 111 billion and exports are around 95 billion so it's rather balanced uh, also for the foreign investments big majority is coming from the West um, and mainly from the EU and I've also checked this with some business organizations recently apparently it is also the case in 2024 so uh, um, the current trends have not changed anything but when it comes to China so imports from China in 2023 was uh, almost 45 billion dollars and exports to china only 3.5 billion so there is a huge imbalance there um so we need to see the benefits of such things too can we really change this um dynamics by getting closer to breaks to china or not really because uh the, the potential doesn't seem to be uh, there either and of course more importantly as well because when we discuss this people also say that okay on the one hand there's eu on the other hand there is BRICS. but uh eu is not only about economy either i mean when it comes to BRICS, obviously they don't care about values they don't care about democracy rule of law fundamental rights and maybe this is fine for the current government i don't think they they really care about these issues either but i think turkey should care meaning turkish opposition turkish civil society turkish business organizations they should care about this dimension too that's why i'm a little bit surprised that uh, there was no real reaction and this was not really discussed in turkey i know there's a lot in the agenda there are always like some domestic political uh, matters discussed and high on the agenda but this is important and this is important for the mid and long term uh, interests of turkey as well i mean it is fine to have peaceful relations with countries in different regions including china it's also fine to develop better economic ties all over the world there's not a 
problem. But one should really understand that such structural partnership uh, sort of changing the historical root of the country. And it is really changing the future of the country as well. And it's extremely risky. So uh, that's why I think also internally we need to discuss these issues. Um, and in any case, you talked about the strategy. I totally agree. I mean, also, I mean, more, more common in Turkey, but also abroad. Some people really believe that, oh, Turkey is doing this and that and they have this grand strategy but no not really i mean uh i think the main strategy nowadays especially is saving the day and to create some sort of short-term benefits to find different ways to improve the economy and the entire aim is actually reversing the decline of the akp because they see how the economic problems damaging uh the government and the support to government so all of these steps including with the join to uh briggs must be seen from this angle they do a very simple calculation we do business with the west anyway if we can increase our economic ties with china and others then we can improve economy it cannot hurt i mean uh but there's a very simple calculation and i've explained like this may not uh, result in um in positive way for turkey either as in the 10 plus 2 example so uh this fact is not really seen uh but the main problem and i'm a bit tired of repeating this and i know i do this in almost every episode but for a country like turkey you don't need to try all these things actually there's only one recipe to improve the economy you need more democracy more rule of law but also more predictability in foreign policy as well because people like to trust each other i mean it's also in personal relationships i mean if you start uh another tv show uh on youtube called talk turkish affairs next day with someone else i would be like nation what's going on like this is normal also in personal relationships but also in uh international affairs too so we need some sort of transparency and predictability and this is not there but i think also one of the main problems turkey is focusing on too much on domestic affairs that even internally we don't discuss such things i don't know did you see any major reactions except maybe uh, one or two tweets coming from the opposition party to this BRICS membership matter uh you're muted it's it's just discussed among elites and journalists and this and that not really i mean not even in in in, in politics um in a sense well one reason is it's too complicated for the uh, for the you know man on the street basically uh, for like common people BRICS this and that whatever but what what the government is doing that actually they're playing a dangerous game there so i agree with you they are pumping this anti-western anti-american sentiments for the uh, domestic political gain and but they're pumping it really i mean uh, on tv channels in turkish series they're really pumping it uh, as, as, a, as a propaganda why are they doing it first of all i think they have their own ideological stance second of all i think all their um paradigm about the world is based on false premises so they literally believe that west is in the decline west is finished both economically they literally believe that you know the, there's nothing it, they think it's, it's going to be china china is going to be leading the world uh and then it's going to be a different future that's what they believe in um you could you could say, you could say that's a wishful thinking on their end also but they really believe in that so they are they think they are basically um organizing a multi-layered foreign policy in this uh, upcoming what they call is a, a multipolar world so they want multiple partnerships they think turkey can play a bridging role between east and west uh, when china takes over i think they're preparing themselves for that when china takes over turkey will be a, you know they think a critical muslim country within the region and this and that so they can be a nato member but at the same time they can be really close to china and then they can you know play along you know uh, i think that's that's what they're foreseeing uh, as far as i understand but as i said i mean uh, basically hakan fidan is a very very ideological person i mean don't like he said the other day he said american politics is very very problematic because he said zionists there basically taking up politicians when they're really young they're educating them they're financing them and then they're helping these people in the american politics and that's why uh in american politics everybody's a zionist like he says something like that that's how he sees america and that's how he reads into the eu i don't know maybe when he's talking to his western partners he sounds different but like in turkey he sounds like a i don't know really 
very irrational, I'd say. But I think he's more sincere when he's talking to the Turks, when he's giving these TV interviews and this and that. So I think that's what they believe in, and that's what they're trying to build Turkish, Turkish foreign policy on. You yeah. know, who knows? I mean, I don't know about his double discourse, but we have a clear example, for example, with the finance minister. When he comes to Brussels, he talks about all this democracy, fundamental rights, freedoms, reforms in terms of rule of law, justice system, and everything. Uh, but then when he's back to Turkey, we don't see such statements. So uh, there's clearly uh, such a double discourse. At least there are some examples. That's a very good point. Exactly. Because Mehmet Shimshek is like he's portraying himself li like uh, he doesn't deal with everyday politics. He's just a technocrat. He, come, he came to Turkey with, with a very, 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 very technocratic program. He's just going to deal with the inflation. That's it. He doesn't even talk about talk like an AK Party person. He does his thing. He's a very techno. But what you're mentioning is very important. But if he if that's the case, when he goes to Brussels, he talks about democracy and this and that. Yeah, no. And for our viewers, uh, no, he does not do that in Turkey. He doesn't even mention that. He just talks very, very in very, very technical terms when he gives interviews and this and that he doesn't say anything about daily politics yeah and the, so the so the so the new topic uh, of, of turkish politics is you know they opened the parliament the new uh, constitution basically but what's interesting when they start talking about the new constitution they don't mention democracy that much mm -hmm. what they say is like this old constitution was written by back then putschists what not uh, so now we have to change it we have to have a like um, a constitution written by every walks of life and every strata of the society a, a whole new constitution but they really do not mention democracy as much you know that used to be the motto of AK party in the first years of AK party government they used democracy the word the concept democracy extensively sometimes um, they kind of used it in pragmatic ways also but now they're not even mentioning it that's that's also important important i'd say yeah. yeah and i think it's also so, a topic i mean i mean more bricks like well. <laughs> more more bricks more bricks minded in a in a, in a sense you know yeah. yeah or maybe that's their dream as well yeah we'll see we'll see about that okay so probably we'll talk about also those uh, developments in terms of new constitution of uh, but, but already uh discussions about the next presidential elections uh candidates and everything um turkey is already sort of discussing the next steps mm -hmm. uh but we will come to that in the next episodes we will so until then see ya, see ya.